This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Old King Cole, a selection from Mother Goose in Prose by L. Frank Baum. Read by West Winds Twelve. Old King Cole was a merry old soul, and a merry old soul was he. He called for his pipe, and he called for his bowl, and he called for his fiddlers three. Old King Cole was not always a king, nor was he born a member of any royal family. It was only chance, hard luck he used to call it, that made him a king at all. He had always been a poor man, being the son of an apple peddler, who died and left him nothing but a donkey and a fiddle. But that was enough for Cole, who never bothered his head about the world's goods, but took things as they came and refused to worry about anything. So, when the house he lived in, and the furniture, and even the apple cart were sold to pay his father's debts, and he found himself left with the old fiddle that nobody wanted, and the old donkey that no one would have. It being both vicious and unruly, he uttered no word of complaint. He simply straddled the donkey, and took the fiddle under his arm, and rode out into the world to seek his fortune. When he came to a village, he played a merry tune upon his fiddle, and sang a merry song with it, and the people gave him food most willingly. There was no trouble about a place to sleep, for if he was denied a bed, he lay down with the donkey in a barn, or even on the village green, and making a pillow of the donkey's neck, he slept as soundly as any one could in a bed of down. And so he continued riding along and playing upon his fiddle for many years, until his head had grown bald, and his face was wrinkled, and his bushy eyebrows became as white as snow. But his eyes never lost their merry twinkle, and he was just as fat and hearty as in his younger days, while, if you heard him singing his songs and scraping upon the old fiddle, you would know at once his heart was as young as ever. He never guided the donkey, but let the beast go where it would, and so it happened that at last they came to Whatland, and entered one day the city where resided the king of that great country. Now, even as Cole rode upon his donkey, the king of Whatland lay dying in his palace, surrounded by all the luxury of the court, and as he left no heir, and was the last of the royal line, the counsellors and the wise men of Whatland were in a great quandary as to who should succeed him. But finally they bethought themselves of the laws of the land, and upon looking up the records they found in an old book a law that provided for just such a case as this. If the king dies, so read the law, and there be no one to succeed to the throne, the prime minister shall be blinded and led from the palace into the main street of the city, and he shall stretch out his arms and walk about, and the first person he touches shall be crowned as king of the land. The counsellors were greatly pleased when they found this law, for it enabled them to solve the problem that confronted them. So when the king had breathed his last, they blindfolded the prime minister and led him forth from the palace, and he began walking about with outstretched arms, seeking someone to touch. Of course the people knew nothing of this law, nor even that the old king was dead and seeing the Prime Minister groping about blindfolded, they kept out of his way, fearing they might be punished if he stumbled against them. But Cole was then riding along on the donkey, and did not even know it was the Prime Minister who was feeling about in such a funny way. So he began to laugh, and the Minister, who had by this time grown tired of the game, heard the laugh, and came toward the stranger, and touched him, and immediately all the wise men and the counsellors fell down before him and hailed him as King of Whatland. Thus did the wandering fiddler become King Cole, and you may be sure he laughed more merrily than ever when they explained to him his good fortune. 
They carried him within the palace, and dressed him in purple and fine linen, and placed a crown of gold upon his bald head, and a jeweled scepter in his wrinkled hand, and all this amused old King Cole very much. When he had been led to the great throne room, and placed upon the throne of gold, where the silken cushions felt very soft and pleasant after his long ride upon the donkey's sharp back, the courtiers all knelt before him and asked what commands he wished to give, since every one in the kingdom must now obey his slightest word. "'Oh, well,' said the new king, "'I think the first thing I would like is my old pipe. You'll find it in the pocket of the ragged coat I took off.' One of the officers of the court at once ran for the pipe, and when it was brought King Cole filled it with tobacco from his greasy pouch and lighted it and you can imagine what a queer sight it was to see the fat king sitting upon the rich throne, dressed in silk and satins and a gold crown, and smoking at the same time an old black pipe. The counsellors looked at each other in dismay, and the ladies of the court sneezed and coughed and seemed greatly shocked at all this pleased King Cole so much that he laid back in his throne and roared with laughter. Then the Prime Minister came forward very gravely, and bowed low, he said, "'May it please your Majesty, it is not the custom of kings to smoke a pipe while seated on the throne.' "'But is my custom,' answered Cole. "'It is impolite and unkingly,' ventured the Minister. "'Now see here, old fellow,' replied his Majesty, "'I didn't ask to be king of this country. It's all your own doing.' All my life I have smoked whenever I wished, and if I can't do as I please here, why, I won't be king. So there. But you must be king, your majesty, whether you want to or not. The law says so. If that's the case, returned the king, I can do as I please in other things. So you just run and get me a bowl of punch. There's a good fellow. The aged minister did not like to be addressed thus, but the king's commands must be obeyed, so, although the court was greatly horrified, he brought the bowl of punch, and the king pushed his crown on to the back of his head, and drank heartily, and smacked his lips afterwards. "'That's fine,' he said. "'But say, what do you people do to amuse yourselves?' "'Whatever your majesty commands,' answered one of the counsellors. "'What?' Must I amuse you as well as myself? Methinks it's no easy task to be a king, if so many things are required of me. But, I suppose, it is useless to fret, since the law obliges me to reign in this great country against my will. Therefore will I make the best of my misfortune, and propose we have a dance, and forget our cares. Send at once for some fiddlers, and clear the room, for our merry-making, and for once in our lives we shall have a jolly good time. So one of the officers of the court went out, and soon returned with three fiddlers, and when at the king's command they struck up a tune, the monarch was delighted, for every fiddler had a very fine fiddle, and knew well how to use it. Now old King Cole was a merry old soul, so he soon set all the ladies and gentlemen of the court to dancing and he himself took off his crown and his ermine robes and laid them upon the throne, while he danced with the prettiest lady present until he was all out of breath. Then he dismissed them, and they were all very well pleased with the new king, for they saw that, in spite of his odd ways, he had a kind heart and would try to make everyone about him as merry as he was himself. The next morning, the king was informed that several of his subjects craved audience with him, as there were matters of dispute between them that must be settled. King Cole at first refused to see them, declaring he knew nothing of the quarrels of his subjects, and must manage their own affairs. But when the Prime Minister told him it was one of his duties as king, the law required it, he could not do otherwise than submit. So he put on his crown and his ermine robes, and sat upon the throne, although he grumbled a good deal at the necessity, for never having had any business of his own to attend to, he thought it doubly hard that in his old age he must attend to the business of others. 
The first case of dispute was between two men who each claimed to own a fine cow, and after hearing the evidence the king ordered the cow to be killed and roasted and given to the poor, since that was the easiest way to decide the matter. Then followed a quarrel between two subjects over ten pieces of gold, one claiming the other owed him that sum. The king, thinking them both rascals, ordered the gold to be paid, and then he took it and scattered it among the beggars outside the palace. By this time King Cole decided he had had transacted enough business for one day, so he sent word to those outside that if anyone had a quarrel that was not just he should be severely punished. And, indeed, when the subjects learned the manner in which the king settled disputes, they were afraid to come to him, as both sides were sure to be losers by the decision. And that saved King Cole a lot of trouble thereafter, for the people thought best to settle their own differences. The king, now seeing that he was free to do as he pleased, retired to his private chamber, where he called for the three fiddlers, and made them play for him while he smoked his pipe and drank a bowl of punch. Every evening he had a dance in the palace, and every day there were picnics and merry-makings of all kinds, and before long King Cole had the reputation of having the merriest court in all the world. He loved to feast, and to smoke, and to drink his punch, and he was never so merry as when others were merry with him so that the three fiddlers were almost always by his side, and at any hour of the day you could hear sweet strains of music echoing through the palace. Old King Cole did not forget the donkey that had been his constant companion for so long. He had a golden saddle made for him, with a saddle-cloth embroidered in gold and silver, and the bridle was studded with diamonds and precious stones, all taken from the king's treasury and when he rode out, the old fat king always bestrode the donkey, while his courtiers rode on either side of him upon their prancing chargers. Old King Cole reigned for many years, and was generally beloved by his subjects, for he always gave liberally to all who asked, and was always as merry and happy as the day was long. When he died, the new king was found to be of a very different temper, and ruled the country with great severity. But this only served to make the memory of old King Cole more tenderly cherished by his people, and they often sighed when they recalled his merry pranks and the good times they enjoyed under his rule. The End of Old King Cole A Selection from Mother Goose in Prose by L. Frank Baum LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mistress Mary from Mother Goose in Prose by L. Frank Baum. Mistress Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow? with dingle-bells and cockle-shells and cowslips all in a row. High upon a cliff that overlooked the sea was a little white cottage, in which dwelt a sailor and his wife, with their two strong sons and a little girl. The sons were also sailors, and had made several voyages with their father in a pretty ship called the Skylark. Their names were Hobart and Robart. The little girl's name was Mary, and she was very happy indeed when her father and her brothers were at home, for they petted her and played games with her, and loved her very dearly. But when Skylark went to sea, and her mother and herself were left alone in the little white cottage, the hours were very dull and tedious, and Mary counted the days until the sailors came home again. One spring, just as the grasses began to grow green upon the cliff, and the trees were dressing their stiff barren branches in robes of delicate foliage. The father and brothers bade good-bye to Mary and her mother, for they were starting upon a voyage to the Black Sea. "'And how long will you be gone, Papa?' asked Mary, who was perched upon her father's knee, where she could nestle her soft cheek against his bushy whiskers. 
"'How long?' he repeated, stroking her curls tenderly as he spoke. "'Well, well, my darling, it will be a long time indeed. "'Do you know the cowslips that grow in the pastures, Mary?' "'Oh, yes, I watch for them every spring,' she answered. "'And do you know the dingle-bells that grow near the edge of the wood?' he asked again. "'I know them well, Papa,' replied Mary, "'for I often gather their blue blossoms and put them in a vase upon the table. "'And how about the cockle-shells?' "'Them also I know,' said Mary eagerly, "'for she was glad her father should find her so well acquainted with the field-flowers.' There is nothing prettier than the big white flowers of the cockle-shells. But tell me, Papa, what have the flowers to do with your coming home? Why, just this, sweetheart, returned the sailor gravely. All the time that it takes the cowslips and the dingle-bells and cockle-shells to sprout from the ground and grow big and strong and blossom into flower, and, yes, to wither and die away again, all that time shall your brothers and I sail the seas. But when the cold winds begin to blow, and the flowers are gone, then, God willing, we shall come back to you, and by that time you may have grown wiser and bigger, and I am sure you will have grown older. So one more kiss, sweetheart, and then we must go, for our time is up. The next morning, when Mary and her mother had dried their eyes, which had been wet with grief at the departure of their loved ones, the little girl asked earnestly, "'Mama, may I make a flower-garden?' "'A flower-garden?' repeated her mother in surprise. "'Why do you wish a flower-garden, Mary?' "'I want to plant in it the cockle-shells and the cowslips and the dingle-bells,' she answered. And her mother, who had heard what the sailor had said to his little girl, knew at once what Mary meant. So she kissed her daughter and replied, "'Yes, Mary, you may have the flower-garden if you wish.' We will dig a nice little bed just at the side of the house, and you shall plant your flowers and care for them yourself. I think I'd rather have the flowers at the front of the house, said Mary. But why, inquired her mother, they will be better sheltered at the side. I want them in front, persisted Mary, for the sun shines stronger there. Very well, answered her mother. Make your garden at the front, if you will, and I will help you dig the ground. "'But I don't want you to help,' said Mary, "'for this is to be my own little flower-garden, "'and I want to do all the work myself. "'Now I must tell you that this little girl, "'although very sweet in many ways, "'had one serious fault. "'She was inclined to be a bit contrary, "'and put her own opinions and ideas "'before those of her elders. "'Perhaps Mary meant no wrong in this,' She often thought she knew better how to do a thing than others did, and in such a case she was not only contrary, but anxious to have her own way. And so her mother, who did not like her little daughter to be unhappy, often gave way to her in small things, and now she permitted Mary to make her own garden, and plant it as she would. So Mary made a long, narrow bed at the front of the house, and then she prepared to plant her flowers. "'If you scatter the seeds,' said her mother, "'the flower-bed will look very pretty. "'Now this is what Mary was about to do. "'But since her mother advised it, "'she tried to think of another way, "'for, as I said, she was contrary at times. "'And in the end she planted the dingle-bells "'all in one straight row, "'and the cockle-shells in another straight row, "'the length of the bed, "'and she finished by planting the cowslips "'in another long row at the back.' Her mother smiled, but said nothing, and now, as the days passed by, Mary watered and tended her garden with great care, and when the flowers began to sprout, she plucked all the weeds that grew among them, and so in the mild spring weather the plants grew finely. "'When they have grown up big and strong,' said Mary one morning, as she weeded the bed, "'and when they have budded and blossomed and faded away again, then Papa and my brothers will come home.' and I shall call the cockle-shells Papa, for they are the biggest and strongest, and the dingle-bells shall be Brother Hobart, and the cowslips Brother Robert. And now I feel as if the flowers were really my dear ones, and I must be very careful that they come to no harm. 
She was filled with joy when one morning she ran out to her flower garden after breakfast and found the dingle bells and cowslips were actually blossoming, while even the cockle shells were showing their white buds. They looked rather comical, all standing in stiff, straight rows, one after the other, but Mary didn't mind that. While she was working, she heard the tramp of a horse's hoofs, and looking up, saw the big bluff squire riding toward her. The big squire was very fond of children, and whenever he rode near the little white cottage, he stopped to have a word with Mary. He was old and bald-headed, and he had side whiskers that were very red in color and very short and stubby. But there was ever a merry twinkle in his blue eyes, and Mary well knew him for her friend. Now, when she looked up and saw him coming toward her flower garden, she nodded and smiled to him, and the big bluff squire rode up to her side and looked down with a smile at her flowers. Then he said to her in rhyme, for it was a way of speaking the jolly squire had, Mistress Mary so contrary, how does your garden grow? With dingle bells and cockle shells and cowslips all in a row. And Mary, being a sharp little girl, and knowing the squire's queer ways, replied to him likewise in rhyme, saying, I thank you, squire, that you inquire how well the flowers are growing. The dingle bells and cockle shells and cowslips all are a-blowing. The squire laughed at this reply and patted her upon the head, and then he continued, Tis aptly said, but prithee maid, why thus your garden fill, when every field the same flowers yield to pluck them as you will? "'That is a long story, squire,' said Mary. "'But this much I may tell you. "'The cockle shells is father's flower, "'the cowslips here is Robart. "'The dingle bell, I now must tell, "'I've named for brother Hobart. "'And when the flowers have lived their lives "'in sunshine and in rain, "'and then do fade, why papa said, "'he'd sure come home again.' "'Oh, that's the idea, is it?' "'asked the big bluff squire.' forgetting his poetry. Well, it's a pretty thought, my child, and I think because the flowers are strong and hardy that you may know your father and brothers are the same, and I'm sure I hope they'll come back from their voyage safe and sound. I shall come and see you again, little one, and watch the garden grow. And then he said, Gee up, to his gray mare, and rode away. The very next day, to Mary's great surprise and grief, she found the leaves of the dingle bells curling and beginning to wither. "'Oh, Mama," she called, "'come quick! Something is surely the matter with Brother Hobart!' "'The dingle bells are dying,' said her mother, after looking carefully at the flowers. "'But the reason is that the cold winds from the sea swept right over your garden last night, and dingle bells are delicate flowers and grow best where they are sheltered by the woods.' If you had planted them at the side of the house as I wished you to, the wind would not have killed them. Mary did not reply to this, but sat down and began to weep, feeling at the same time that her mother was right, and it was her own fault for being so contrary. While she sat thus, the squire rode up and called to her, "'Fie, Mary, fie, why do you cry and blind your eyes to knowing?' How dingle bells and cockle shells and cowslips all are growing. Oh, squire, sobbed Mary, I am in great trouble. Each dingle bell I loved so well before my eyes is dying, and much I fear my brother dear in sickness now is lying. Nonsense, said the squire, because you named the flowers after your brother Hobart, is no reason he should be affected by the fading of the dingle bells. I very much suspect the real reason they are dying is because the cold sea wind caught them last night. Dingle bells are delicate. If you had scattered the cockle shells and cowslipped all about them, the stronger plants would have protected the weaker. But you see, my girl, you planted the dingle bells all in a row, so the wind caught them nicely. Again, Mary reproached herself for having been contrary and refusing to listen to her mother's advice. But the squire's words comforted her, nevertheless, and made her feel that her brother Hobart and the flowers had really nothing to do with each other. 
The weather now began to change, and the cold sea winds blew each night over Mary's garden. She did not know this, for she was always lying snugly tucked up in her bed, and the warm morning sun usually drove away the winds. But her mother knew it, and feared Mary's garden would suffer. One day Mary came into the house where her mother was at work, and said gleefully, "'Papa and my brothers will be soon home now.' "'Why do you think so?' asked her mother. "'Because the cockle-shells and cowslips are both fading away and dying, "'just as the dingle-bells did, "'and Papa said when they faded and withered, "'he and the boys would come back to us.' "'Mary's mother knew that the harsh winds had killed the flowers before their time, "'but she did not like to disappoint her darling, "'so she only said with a sigh, "'I hope you are right, Mary.' "'for we both shall be glad to welcome our dear ones home again. "'But soon afterward the big bluff squire came riding up, "'as was his wont, to where Mary stood by her garden, "'and he at once asked, "'Pray tell me, dear, though much I fear, the answer sad I know, "'how grow the sturdy cockle-shells and cowslips all in a row?' "'And Mary looked up at him with her bright smile and answered, "'Dingle-bells and cockle-shells and cowslips are all a-dead, "'and now my papa's coming home, for so he surely said.' "'Ah,' said the squire, looking at her curiously, "'I'm afraid you are getting way ahead of time. "'See here, Mary, how would you like a little ride with me on my nag?' "'I would like it very much, sir,' replied Mary. "'Then reach up your hand. Now there you are, little one.' and Mary found herself seated safely in front of the squire, who clasped her with one strong arm so she could not slip off. "'Now then,' he said, "'we'll take a little ride down the hill and by the path that runs beside the wood.' So he gave rein to his mare, and they rode along, chatting merrily together till they came to the wood. Then said the squire, "'Take a look within that nook and tell me what is there.' And Mary exclaimed, a dingle-bell, and truth to tell, in full bloom, I declare. The squire now clucked to his nag, and as they rode away he said, Now come with me, and you shall see a field with cowslips bright, and not a garden in the land can show so fair a sight. And so it was, for as they rode through the pastures the cowslips bloomed on every hand, and Mary's eyes grew bigger and bigger as she thought of her poor garden with its dead flowers. And then the squire took her toward the little brook that wandered through the meadows, flowing over the pebbles with a soft, gurgling sound that was very nearly as sweet as music. And when they reached it, the big squire said, If you will look beside the brook, you'll see, I know quite well, that hidden in each mossy nook is many a cockle shell. This was indeed true. And as Mary saw them, she suddenly dropped her head and began to weep. "'What's the matter, little one?' asked the squire in his kind, bluff voice. And Mary answered, "'Although the flowers I much admire, you know Papa did say, "'He won't be home again, squire, till all have passed away.' "'You must be patient, my child,' replied her friend, "'and surely you would not have been thus disappointed "'had you not tried to make the field flowers grow where they do not belong.' Gardens are all well enough for fancy flowers to grow in, but the posies that God gave to all the world, and made to grow wild in the great garden of nature, will never thrive in any other places. Your father meant you to watch the flowers in the field, and if you will come and visit them each day, you will find the time waiting very short indeed. Mary dried her eyes and thanked the kindly old squire, and after that she visited the fields each day and watched the flowers grow. And it was not so very long, as the squire said, before the blossoms began to wither and fall away, and finally one day Mary looked out over the sea and saw a little speck upon the waters that looked like a sail. And when it came nearer and had grown larger, both she and her mother saw that it was the skylark come home again, and you can imagine how pleased and happy the sight of the pretty little ship made them. And soon after, when Mary had been hugged by her two sunburned brothers, 
and was clasped in her father's strong arms, she whispered, "'I knew you were coming soon, Papa.' "'And how did you know, sweetheart?' he asked, giving her an extra kiss. "'Because I watched the flowers, and the dingle-bells, and the cowslips, and the cockle-shells, are all withered and faded away. And did you not say that, God willing, when this happened, you would come back to us? To be sure I did, answered her father with a happy laugh, and I must have spoken truly, sweetheart, for God in his goodness was willing, and here I am. End of Mistress Mary This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Wondrous Wise Man from Mother Goose in Prose by L. Frank Baum There was a man in our town, and he was wondrous wise. He jumped into a bramble-bush, and scratched out both his eyes. And when he saw his eyes were out, with all his might and main, he jumped into another bush, and scratched them in again. Our town is a quiet little town, and lies nestling in a little valley, surrounded by pretty green hills. I do not think you would ever have heard our town mentioned, had not the man lived there who was so wise that every one marvelled at his great knowledge. He was not always a wise man. He was a wise boy before he grew to manhood, and even when a child he was so remarkable for his wisdom that people shook their heads gravely and said, When he grows up there will be no need of books, for he will know everything. His father thought he had a wondrous wise look when he was born, and so he named him Solomon, thinking that if indeed he turned out to be wise, the name would fit him nicely, whereas, should he be mistaken and the boy grow up stupid, his name could easily be changed to Simon. But the father was not mistaken, and the boy's name remained Solomon. When he was still a child, Solomon confounded the schoolmaster by asking one day, "'Can you tell me, sir, why a cow drinks water from a brook?' "'Well, really,' replied the abashed schoolmaster, "'I have never given the subject serious thought. But I will sleep upon the question, and try to give you an answer to-morrow.' But the schoolmaster could not sleep. He remained awake all the night, trying to think why a cow drinks water from a brook, and in the morning he was no nearer the answer than before. So he was obliged to appear before the wise child, and acknowledge that he could not solve the problem. "'I have looked at the subject from every side,' said he, "'and given it careful thought. And yet I cannot tell why a cow drinks water from a brook.' "'Sir,' replied the wise child, it is because the cow is thirsty. The shock of this answer was so great that the schoolmaster fainted away, and when they had brought him to, he made a prophecy that Solomon would grow up to be a wondrous wise man. It was the same way with the village doctor. Solomon came to him one day and asked, Tell me, sir, why has a man two eyes? Bless me! exclaimed the doctor. I must think a bit before I answer, for I have never yet had my attention called to this subject. So he thought for a long time, and then he said, I must really give it up. I cannot tell for the life of me why a man has two eyes. Do you know? Yes, sir, answered the boy. Then, said the doctor, after taking a dose of quinine to brace up his nerves, for he remembered the fate of the schoolmaster, "'Then please tell me why a man has two eyes.' "'A man has two eyes, sir, 
returned Solomon solemnly, because he was born that way. And the doctor marveled greatly at so much wisdom in a little child, and made a note of it in his notebook. Solomon was so full of wisdom that it flowed from his mouth in a perfect stream, and every day he gave new evidence to his friends that he could scarcely hold all the wise thoughts that came to him. For instance, one day he said to his father, I perceive our dog has six legs. Oh, no, replied his father. Our dog only has four legs. You are surely mistaken, sir, said Solomon, with the gravity that comes from great wisdom. These are our dog's four legs, are they not? Pointing to the front legs of the dog. Yes, answered his father. Well, continued Solomon, the dog has two other legs besides, and two and four are six. Therefore the dog has six legs. But that is very old, exclaimed his father. True, replied Solomon, but this is a young dog. Then his father bowed his head in shame, that his own child should teach him wisdom. Of course Solomon wore glasses upon his eyes all wise people wear them, and his face was ever grave and solemn, while he walked slowly and stiffly, so that people might know he was the celebrated wise man, and do him reverence. And when he had grown to manhood, the fame of his wisdom spread all over the world, so that all the other wise men were jealous, and tried in many ways to confound him. But Solomon always came out ahead, and maintained his reputation for wisdom. Finally, a very wise man came from Cumberland to meet Solomon and see which of them was the wisest. He was a very big man, and Solomon was a very little man, and so the people all shook their heads sadly, and feared Solomon had met his match. For if the Cumberland man was as full of wisdom as Solomon, he had much the advantage in size. They formed a circle around the two wise men, and then began the trial to see which was the wisest. "'Tell me,' said Solomon, looking straight up into the big man's face with an air of confidence that reassured his friends, "'how many sisters has a boy who has one father, one mother, and seven brothers?' The big wise man got very red in the face and scowled, and coughed, and stammered, but he could not tell. I do not know, he acknowledged, nor do you know either, for there is no rule to go by. Oh, yes, I know, replied Solomon. He has two sisters. I know this is the true answer, because I know the boy, and his father, and his mother, and his brothers, and his sisters, so that I cannot be mistaken. Now all the people applauded at this, for they were sure Solomon had got the best of the man from Cumberland. But it was now the big man's turn to try Solomon. So he said, Fingers five are on my hand. All of them upright do stand. One a dog is, chasing kittens. One a cat is, wearing mittens. One a rat is, eating cheese. One a wolf is, full of fleas. One a fly is, in a cup. How many fingers do I hold up? Four, replied Solomon promptly, for one of them is a thumb. The wise man from Cumberland was so angry at being outwitted that he sprang at Solomon, and would no doubt have injured him, had not our wise man turned and run away as fast as he could go. The man from Cumberland at once ran after him, and chased him through the streets, and down the lanes, and up the side of the hill where the bramble-bushes grow. Solomon ran very fast, 
but the man from Cumberland was bigger, and he was just about to grab our wise man by his coat-tails, when Solomon gave a great jump, and jumped right into the middle of a big bramble-bush. The people were all coming up behind, and as the big man did not dare to follow Solomon into the bramble-bush, he turned away and ran home to Cumberland. All the men and women of our town were horrified when they came up and found their wise man in the middle of the bramble-bush and held fast by the brambles, which scratched and pricked him on every side. "'Solomon, are you hurt?' they cried. "'I should say I am hurt,' replied Solomon with a groan. "'My eyes are scratched out.' "'How do you know they are?' asked the village doctor. "'I can see they are scratched out,' replied Solomon. And the people all wept with grief at this, and Solomon howled louder than any of them. Now the fact was that when Solomon jumped into the bramble-bush he was wearing his spectacles, and the brambles pushed the glasses so close against his eyes that he could not open them, and so, as every other part of him was scratched and bleeding, and he could not open his eyes, he made sure they were scratched out. "'How am I to get out of here?' he asked at last. "'You must jump out,' replied the doctor, "'since you have jumped in.' So Solomon made a great jump, and although the brambles tore him cruelly, he sprang entirely out of the bush, and fell plump into another one. This last bush, however, by good luck, was not a bramble-bush, but one of elderberry, and when he jumped into it his spectacles fell off, and to his surprise he opened his eyes, and found that he could see again. "'Where are you now?' called out the doctor. "'I'm in the elderberry-bush, and I've scratched my eyes in again,' answered Solomon. When the people heard this, they marvelled greatly at the wisdom of a man who knew how to scratch his eyes in after they were scratched out, and they lifted Solomon from the bush and carried him home, where they bound up the scratches and nursed him carefully until he was well again. And after that no one ever questioned the wondrous wisdom of our wise man, and when he finally died, at a good old age, they built a great monument over his grave, and on one side of it were the words, Solomon, the man who was wondrous wise, and on the other side was a picture of a bramble bush. End of The Wondrous Wise Man Recorded by Andrew Lebrun of Boston, Massachusetts, November 4th, 2006. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That's L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X dot O-R-G. Recording by Christy Nowak What Jack Horner Did From Mother Goose in Prose By L. Frank Baum Little Jack Horner sat in a corner, eating his Christmas pie. He put in his thumb and pulled out a plum and said, What a good boy am I! Little Jack Horner lived in an old tumble-down house at the edge of a big wood, and there many generations of Horners had lived before him, and had earned their living by chopping wood. Jack's father and mother were both dead, and he lived with his grandfather and grandmother, who took great pains to teach him all that a boy should know. They lived very comfortably and happily together, until one day a great tree fell on Grandpa Horner and crushed his legs, and from that time on he could not work at all, but had to be nursed and tended very carefully. This calamity was a great affliction to the Horners. Grandma Horner had a little money saved up in an old broken teapot that she kept in the cupboard, but that would not last them a great time, and when it was gone they would have nothing with which to buy food. I'm sure I don't know what is to become of us, she said to Jack, for I am too old to work, and you are too young. She always told her troubles to Jack now, small though he was. He was the only one she could talk freely with, since it would only bother the poor crippled grandfather to tell him how low the money was getting in the teapot. 
"'It is true,' replied Jack, "'that you are too old to work, "'for your rheumatism will barely allow you "'to care for the house and cook our meals, "'and there is Grandpa to be tended. "'But I am not too young to work, Grandma, "'and I shall take my little hatchet "'and go into the wood. "'I cannot cut the big trees, "'but I can cut the smaller ones, "'and I am sure I shall be able to pile up "'enough wood to secure the money we need for food. "'You are a good boy, dear,' "'said Grandma Horner, patting his head lovingly. "'But you are too young for the task. "'We must think of some other way to keep the wolf from the door.' "'But Jack was not shaken in his resolve, "'although he saw it was useless to argue further with his grandmother. "'So the next morning he rose very early "'and took his little axe and went into the wood to begin his work. "'There were a good many branches scattered about, "'and these he was able to cut with ease. "'And then he piled them up nicely to be sold "'when the wood carter next came round. When dinner time came, he stopped long enough to eat some of the bread and cheese he had brought with him, and then he resumed his work. But scarcely had he chopped one branch when a faint cry from the wood arrested his attention. It seemed as if someone was shouting for help. Jack listened a moment, and again heard the cry. Without hesitation, he seized his axe and ran toward the place from whence the cry had proceeded. The underbrush was very thick, and the thorns caught in his clothing and held him back, but... With the aid of his sharp little axe, he overcame all difficulties, and presently reached a place where the wood was more open. He paused there, for often he had been told by Grandpa Horner that there were treacherous bogs in this part of the wood, which were so covered with mosses and ferns that the ground seemed solid enough to walk upon. But woe to the unlucky traveler who stepped unawares upon their surface, for instantly he found himself caught by the clinging moist clay to sink farther and farther into the bog until, swallowed up in the mire, he would meet a horrible death beneath its slimy surface. His grandfather had told him never to go near these terrible bogs, and Jack, who was an obedient boy, had always kept away from this part of the wood. But as he paused, again that despairing cry came to his ears, very near to him now, it seemed. Help! Forgetful of all save a desire to assist this unknown sufferer, Jack sprang forward with an answering cry, and only halted when he found himself upon the edge of a vast bog. "'Where are you?' he then shouted. "'Here,' answered a voice, and looking down, Jack saw a few feet away the head and shoulders of a man. He had walked into the bog and sunk into its treacherous depths nearly to his waist, and although he struggled bravely, his efforts only seemed to draw him farther down toward a frightful death. For a moment, filled with horror and dismay, Jack stood looking at the man. Then he remembered a story he had once heard of how a man had been saved from the bog. "'Be quiet, sir,' he called to the unfortunate stranger. "'Save all your strength. I may yet be able to rescue you.' He then ran to a tall sapling that stood near and began chopping away with his axe. The keen blade speedily cut through the young but tough wood, and then Jack dragged it to the edge of the bog and, exerting all his strength, pushed it out until the sapling was within reach of the sinking man. "'Grab it, sir,' he called out, "'and hold on tightly. It will keep you from sinking farther into the mire, and when you have gained more strength you may be able to pull yourself out.' "'You are a brave boy,' replied the stranger, "'and I shall do as you tell me.' It was a long and tedious struggle, and often Jack thought the stranger would despair and be unable to drag his body from the firm clutch of the bog. But, little by little, the man succeeded in drawing himself up by the sapling, and at last he was saved, and sank down exhausted upon the firm ground by Jack's side. The boy ran for some water that stood in a slough nearby, and with this he bathed the stranger's face and cooled his parched lips. Then he gave him the remains of his bread and cheese and soon the gentleman became strong enough to walk with Jack's help to the cottage at the edge of the wood. Grandma Horner was greatly surprised to see the strange man approaching, supported by her sturdy little grandson, but she ran to help him and afterward gave him some old clothing of Grandpa Horner's to replace his own muddy garments. When the man had fully rested, she brewed him her last bit of tea, and by that time the stranger declared he felt as good as new. "'Is this your son, ma'am?' he asked, pointing to Jack. "'He is my grandson, sir,' answered the woman. "'He is a good boy,' declared the stranger, "'and a brave boy as well, for he has saved my life. I live far away in a big city and have plenty of money. If you will give Jack to me, I will take him home and educate him and make a great man of him when he grows up.' 
Grandma Horner hesitated, for the boy was very dear to her and the pride of her old age. But Jack spoke up for himself. "'I'll not go,' he said stoutly. "'You are very kind and mean well by me, but Grandma and Grandpa have only me to care for them now, and I must stay with them and cut wood and so keep them supplied with food.' The stranger said nothing more, but he patted Jack's head kindly, and soon after left them and took the road to the city. The next morning Jack went to the wood again and began chopping as bravely as before, and by hard work he cut a great deal of wood, which the woodcarter carried away and sold for him. The pay was not very much, to be sure, but Jack was glad that he was able to earn something to help his grandparents. And so the days passed rapidly away until it was nearly Christmas time, and now, in spite of Jack's earnings, the money was very low indeed in the broken teapot. One day, just before Christmas, a great wagon drove up to the door of the little cottage, and in it was the stranger Jack had rescued from the bog. The wagon was loaded with a store of good things which would add to the comfort of the aged pair and their grandson, including medicines for Grandpa and rare teas for Grandma, and a fine suit of clothes for Jack, who was just then away at work in the wood. When the stranger had brought all these things into the house, he asked to see the old teapot. Trembling with the excitement of their good fortune, Grandma Horner brought out the teapot, and the gentleman drew a bag from beneath his coat and filled the pot to the brim with shining gold pieces. "'If ever you need more,' he said, "'send to me, and you shall have all you wish to make you comfortable.' Then he told her his name and where he lived, so that she might find him if need be, and then he drove away in the empty wagon before Grandma Horner had half finished thanking him. You can imagine how astonished and happy little Jack was when he returned from his work and found all the good things his kind benefactor had brought. Grandma Horner was herself so delighted that she caught the boy in her arms and hugged and kissed him, declaring that his brave rescue of the gentleman had brought them all this happiness in their hour of need. "'Tomorrow is Christmas,' she said, "'and we shall have an abundance with which to celebrate the good day. So I shall make you a Christmas pie, Jack dear, and stuff it full of plums.' for you must have your share of our unexpected prosperity. And Grandma Horner was as good as her word, and made a very delicious pie indeed for her darling grandson. And that is how it came that little Jack Horner sat in a corner eating a Christmas pie. He put in his thumb and pulled out a plum and said, What a good boy am I! And he was a very good boy. Don't you think so? End of What Jack Horner Did a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Julian Jameson. The Man in the Moon from Mother Goose in Prose by L. Frank Baum. THE MAN IN THE MOON The man in the moon came tumbling down, and inquired the way to Norwich. He went by the south, and burned his mouth, with eating cold peas porridge. What? Have you never heard the story of the man in the moon? Then I must surely tell it, for it is very amusing, and there is not a word of truth in it. The man in the moon was rather lonesome, and often he peeked over the edge of the moon and looked down upon the earth and envied all the people who lived together, for he thought it must be vastly more pleasant to have companions to talk to than to be shut up in a big planet all by himself, where he had to whistle to keep himself company. One day he looked down and saw an alderman sailing up through the air towards him. This alderman was being translated, instead of being transported, owing to a misprint in the law. And as he came near, the man in the moon called to him and said, How is everything down on the earth? Everything is lovely, replied the alderman, and I wouldn't leave it if I was not obliged to. 
"'What's a good place to visit down there?' inquired the man in the moon. "'Oh, Norwich is a mighty fine place,' returned the alderman, "'and it's famous for its peas porridge.' And then he sailed out of sight, and left the man in the moon to reflect upon what he had said. The words of the alderman made him more anxious than ever to visit the earth, and so he walked thoughtfully home, and put a few lumps of ice in the stove to keep him warm, and sat down to think how he should manage the trip. You see, everything went by contraries in the moon, and when the man wished to keep warm, he knocked off a few chunks of ice, and put them in his stove and he cooled his drinking water by throwing red-hot coals of fire into the pitcher. Likewise, when he became chilly, he took off his hat and coat, and even his shoes, and so became warm. And in the hot days of summer he put on his overcoat to cool off. All of which seems very queer to you, no doubt, but it wasn't at all queer to the man in the moon, for he was accustomed to it. Well, he sat by his ice-cool fire, and thought about his journey to the earth, and finally he decided the only way he could get there was to slide down a moonbeam. So he left the house, and locked the door, and put the key in his pocket, for he was uncertain how long he should be gone. And then he went to the edge of the moon, and began to search for a good, strong moonbeam. At last he found one that seemed rather substantial, and reached right down to a pleasant-looking spot on the earth. And so he swung himself over the edge of the moon, and put both arms tight around the moonbeam, and started to slide down. But he found it rather slippery, and in spite of all his efforts to hold on, he found himself going faster and faster so that just before he reached the earth he lost his hold and came tumbling down head over heels and fell plump into a river. The cool water nearly scalded him before he could swim out, but fortunately he was near the bank and he quickly scrambled upon the land and sat down to catch his breath. By that time it was morning, and as the sun rose its hot rays cooled him off somewhat so that he began looking about curiously at all the strange sights and wondering where on earth he was. By and by a farmer came along the road by the river with a team of horses drawing a load of hay, and the horses looked so odd to the man in the moon that at first he was greatly frightened, never before having seen horses except from his home in the moon from whence they looked a good deal smaller. But he plucked up courage, and said to the farmer, "'Can you tell me the way to Norwich, sir?' "'Norwich?' repeated the farmer, musingly. "'I don't know exactly where it be, sir, but it's somewhere away to the south.' "'Thank you,' said the man in the moon. "'But stop, I must not call him the man in the moon any longer.' for, of course, he was now out of the moon, so I'll simply call him the man, and you'll know by that which man I mean. Well, the man and the... I mean, the man, but I nearly forgot what I just said. The man turned to the south and began walking briskly along the road, for he had made up his mind to do as the alderman had advised, and travel to Norwich, that he might eat some of the famous peas porridge that was made there. And finally, after a long and tiresome journey, he reached the town, and stopped at one of the first houses he came to, for by this time he was very hungry indeed. A good-looking woman answered his knock at the door, and he asked politely, "'Is this the town of Norwich, madam?' "'Surely this is the town of Norwich,' returned the woman. "'I came here to see if I could get some peas porridge,' continued the man, "'for I hear you make the nicest porridge in the world in this town.' "'That we do, sir,' 
answered the woman, and if you'll step inside, I'll give you a bowl, for I have plenty in the house that is newly made. So he thanked her, and entered the house, and she asked, Will you have it hot or cold, sir? Oh, cold, by all means, replied the man, for I detest anything hot to eat. She soon brought him a bowl of cold peas porridge, and the man was so hungry that he took a big spoonful at once. But no sooner had he put it into his mouth than he uttered a great yell and began dancing frantically about the room, for, of course, the porridge that was cold to earth folk was hot to him, and the big spoonful of cold peas porridge had burned his mouth to a blister. "'What's the matter?' asked the woman. "'Matter?' screamed the man. "'Why, your porridge is so hot it has burned me.' "'Fiddlesticks,' she replied. "'The porridge is quite cold.' "'Try it yourself,' he cried. So she tried it, and found it very cold and pleasant. But the man was so astonished to see her eat the porridge that had blistered his own mouth, that he became frightened, and ran out of the house and down the street as fast as he could go. The policeman on the first corner saw him running, and promptly arrested him, and he was marched off to the magistrate for trial. "'What is your name?' asked the magistrate. "'I haven't any,' replied the man. For, of course, as he was the only man in the moon, it wasn't necessary he should have a name. "'Come, come!' "'No nonsense,' said the magistrate. "'You must have some name. Who are you?' "'Why, I'm the man in the moon.' "'That's rubbish,' said the magistrate, eyeing the prisoner severely. "'You may be a man, but you're not in the moon. You're in Norwich.' "'That is true,' answered the man, who was quite bewildered by this idea. "'And, of course, you must be called something,' continued the magistrate." "'Well, then,' said the prisoner, "'if I'm not the man in the moon, "'I must be the man out of the moon, "'so call me that.' "'Very good,' replied the judge. "'Now, then, where did you come from?' "'The moon.' "'Oh, you did, eh? "'How did you get here?' "'I slid down a moonbeam.' "'Indeed. "'Well, what were you running for?' "'A woman gave me some cold peas porridge, "'and it burned my mouth.' The magistrate looked at him a moment in surprise, and then he said, This person is evidently crazy, so take him to the lunatic asylum and keep him there. This would surely have been the fate of the man, had there not been present an old astronomer, who had often looked at the moon through his telescope, and so had discovered that what was hot on earth was cold in the moon and what was cold here was hot there. So he began to think the man had told the truth. Therefore he begged the magistrate to wait a few minutes while he looked through his telescope to see if the man in the moon was there. So, as it was now night, he fetched his telescope and looked at the moon and found there was no man in it at all. It seems to be true, said the astronomer, that the man has got out of the moon somehow or other. Let me look at your mouth, sir, and see if it is really burned. Then the man opened his mouth, and everyone saw plainly it was burned to a blister. Thereupon the magistrate begged his pardon for doubting his word, and asked him what he would like to do next. I'd like to get back to the moon, said the man, for I don't like this earth of yours at all. The nights are too hot. Why, it's quite cool this evening, said the magistrate. I'll tell you what we can do, remarked the astronomer. There's a big balloon in town which belongs to the circus that came here last summer and was pawned for a board bill. We can inflate this balloon and send the man out of the moon home in it. That's a good idea, replied the judge. So the balloon was brought and inflated, and the man got into the basket and gave the word to let go, and then the balloon mounted up into the sky in the direction of the moon. The good people of Norwich stood on the earth and tipped back their heads, 
and watch the balloon go higher and higher, until, finally, the man reached out and caught hold of the edge of the moon, and behold, the next minute he was the man in the moon again. After this adventure he was well contented to stay at home, and I've no doubt if you look through a telescope you will see him there to this day. End of The Man in the Moon